Praise the Lord. Amen. The Lord is in our presence today. Amen. How many of you believe that? Give a hand of praise. Thank you, Jesus, for being in our presence today. Give a hand to the worship team for leading us in beautiful songs which declare praise. Raise your hands and give them praise. Amen. I want to ask, I mean, this is a message for the young people in particular. So I want to ask, does anybody know what was special three days ago, October 31st? Any idea? What is it? Halloween? Okay. Halloween? Okay. Anything else? Jeremiah's birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> He's born on a special day. We'll come to that. Any other things? Anybody else? Diwali. Yeah. That's not what I had in mind. Not Diwali. Not Halloween. Reformation Day. No idea. <laughs> I saw some of the look. Ah, uh, 507 years ago. October 31st, a man by the name of Martin Luther got up with boldness, went to the church, the Catholic church. You and I are standing here to worship the Lord because of what he did. Because that was the day when the church, a group of people who believed in the word of God, who believed in the truth according to the word of God, decided to form a different movement. And that is the day when Protestant movement, Pentecostalism is part of Protestant movement. If you have a Bible in your hand, it is because of that day. If you are taught from the pulpit the truth, it is because of that day. How many of you now rejoice that was indeed God's divine plan. Praise Jesus. Amen. I want you to jump onto your feet with your Bible open. We will start reading a verse. I want all of you, if you have your Bibles, if you are proud that there was a reformation, and if you are proud that you have been saved as a result of that, you should be standing to praise. Declare a praise to Jesus. Raise that Bible and say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Ninvajanam dhyanikyumbo enhridaya ashwasikyum nin. Thank you, Jesus, for the word. Our hearts are open. Oh. Kuri rulin talvarayil tiba mada nin morigal. Kuri rulin. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Tirukaratal. Tirukaratal. Wahichu. Oh, yes. Amen. Yes, oh, Lord. Ilkalimandu, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. On that day, 500 years ago, 
is when the principles were established solo scriptura in word alone solo christus in christ alone sola fide faith alone sola gracia by the grace of god alone and solo di gloria for the name of christ glorified alone alone that is it that is why we are here turn your bibles with me to well while you're standing while we'll read together turn your bibles with me to 1st john 2:15 to 17 1st john 2:15 to 17 there are certain days when i when i get up on stage i want to pray to the lord lord prepare the way ahead of me prepare the way ahead of me that when the word which i speak is in line with what you have in mind today the lord has done that and i'm so grateful for that for though i was you know when i came and i went to the restroom at the bottom i went down and i saw a sunday school class which was going on they were learning about romans chapter 1 which talks about the sin of man and how god is the one who can save them and then i came on top and i sat in the message which pastor was teaching through the word of god through romans 12 1 and 2 where my life is a living sacrifice which i need to be according to the will of god how perfect and then the songs which came i have decided to follow jesus amen no turning back no turning back that is what we sang i got the confirmation that the word was for today let's read it together it says in first john 2 15 to 17 if anybody can read one can read in english one can read in malayalam Amen. Somebody in Malayalam? Amen. Amen. Everybody said amen and you can sit down. You can sit down. I thank and praise God for giving us all this opportunity to be here today, to the, and for especially for me to declare the word. Let me just straight away get into it. This is for young people, and I want to tell you, this is a hard message. It's a hard message, and I'm sure I will not get any amens. It's okay. It's fine. This is the word of God. The Bible is clear. That God is a God of perfect love. We always like to hear that side of the message. God is love. God is good. God is, it's, it's, it's nice. It's great. But if you look at 1 John chapter 4, I mean, I want you to just go back. If you go and look at 1 John chapter 4, number of times God is declaring that he is love. Yes. If you look at verse 7, it says, let us love one another for love is from God. Amen. If you look at the next verse, verse 8, the one who doesn't love doesn't know God, for God is love. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also to love one another. Verse 16, we come to know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Amen. So there are several verses in this book alone, in this chapter alone, where you say that God is love. And I want to tell you, his love is perfect. Amen? If his love is perfect, I want to also share with you, he hates perfectly as well. No amens, I know. If God's love is perfect, he hates perfectly as well. And that is two sides. No, it is the same attribute of a just God. 
This is the character of God. You cannot change it according to your whims and fancies. He is a God who loves perfectly. He is a God who hates perfectly. That is to say, if you love something, you will hate whatever is against that something. You know what I mean? If it is like this, you know, if you love someone, if anything comes against that, you will hate that thing which comes against that person. Yes or no? That is, that is human. But then, then imagine, you know, how God perceives it. So I want to ask you, if you have a love for God, do you hate the things that ha the Lord hates? And greater your love is greater the hatred towards that. The more your affection to what is right, the more your disaffection to what is wrong. I hope you understand that. If you don't get anything, that is all you need to get. The more you love God, the more you will hate the things which God hates. Can you turn with me to Psalms 97 verse 10? Psalms 97 verse 10. It says like this. Just keep your finger there. Let those who love the Lord, says what? Hate evil. A few chapters later, 119 verse 104. If you could just turn. 119 verse 104. It says, I gain understanding from your precepts. Your precepts, therefore, I love. I hate every wrong path. That is the life of a Christian being spoken over there. It's one's love for the truth that causes him or her to hate error. If you love the truth, you will hate the wrong thing. Hence, in a Christian's life, if you hate sin... It is their love for righteousness. That is the reason behind it. So in short, in short, in summary, I'm telling to the young people. If you say you or if you claim that you love the truth, you will do definitely do anything possible that threatens that truth. You will do anything possible to ensure that truth is not destroyed in your life. The psalmist in 119 verse 113 says, Here I say, I love your law, but I hate those who are double-minded. Did everybody get that? Is it there or there? Yeah, thank you. I hate, I love your law. I hate everybody who is double-minded. It's basically saying, I love your law and I hate people who oscillate like a pendulum. Sometimes showing affection for God and sometimes showing not. Word of God says, I hate those people who oscillate. Jesus Christ, I want to bring it to an example. Jesus Christ was fully right when he saw double standard living. And he criticized it. You know the Bible. I'm not here to preach you things which you know. He was hard against the hypocrites. He was hard against the Pharisees. He was so hard that you know that when he came to the church and he saw that this church was a den of thieves, he took the whip and he bait everybody who was there. You know why? Because this God is a perfect loving God who hates perfectly. That fear should be in your heart. That this is a God who loves perfectly, hates perfectly. Now I'm coming back to the verse we read. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. It reads like this. There is a word over there written called world. Do not 
Say that again. Do not love the world. Let me just take that. That's all we need to hear today. Do not love the world. The world, wor the word world, okay, the word world, the term used. John, during his writing style during those times, he used this world in three different ways. I want you to understand that. He used it in three different ways. The first reference of the world can be referred to creation. Whatever you see, nature, universe, creation, that is the first reference of the word world. Okay? John is not asking us to hate that. I want to be very clear. We'll come to this. I, I, he is not telling that that is what I need to hear. That's what you need to hate. Because you will find it all throughout the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8. Over and over again, John is telling that this is the world which God created in all beauty. That is not what is being said here. That is not the world which is being compared. There's a second use of the word world. And that refers to the people who live in this world. And I want to tell you that is also not the reference. John is not talking about that world either. He's not talking about the people. If he was talking about the people, it will be in direct contradiction with this great commandment which God himself says. says, love your enemies as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Or the most famous verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. If, if, if John meant that you need to hate the people, these two verses are contradicting. So I am telling you that is not the world which John mentions. Not the creation, not the people. Then what is John talking about? John is talking about a third reference to the word world. And this third reference to the world refers to the spiritual being or spiritual realm that is in opposition to God and is in rebellion against his kingdom. John is talking about that. It is the third sense of the world which is being recognized here. Do not love the world. He says that your world, your love towards that becomes sinful when it is directed towards a system that is against God's kingdom, God's will. And I want to tell you, that is satanic as well. And let me give you some references to why John refers to that world as being satanic. In that same chapter, where can you read in the first verse which we just read? We just read in the second verse, we read that this world passes away. Yes? We just read, world passes away. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says the world is ignorant of God. The world is ignorant of God. In 3, verses 13, 1 John itself, 3, 3 verses 13, he says that the world hates believers. In 4 verses 1, he says it is an abode for false prophets. It is a, it's a place where false prophets are living. 4 verses 3, it is the abode of the Antichrist. 4 verses 5, it is the abode of unbelievers. And lastly, 5.19, the whole world is controlled by the evil one. You see this, John, and by the way, John 4, uh, in chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, he says, from all of the above, John is referring to the world which is under the control of the devil. And he is talking that this system and this world view or this world system is against and is in war with the Lord. Is in war with the Lord. Is in war with his king and is war with his kingdom. I want you to realize if you live a double standard life, when your affections, when your love is pointed towards the world, 
there is no room for the love of God. If you are pointed your love towards this world system, there is no room for love of God. It becomes sinful, my dear friends. It is sinful. James gives a very, very brutal description about this scenario in your life. Can you turn with me to James chapter 4, verses 4? If anybody can read James chapter 4, verses 4. Oh, please pay attention to that. He is calling you adulterous. Go ahead. Oh, you adulterer. I hope you, you haven't understood the magnitude of that statement. You adulterer. When do you call a person an adulterer? When he cheats. Husband and wife, if they call, if you call a person an adulterer, a husband or a wife has cheated on the other person who they love. James is saying you are an adulterer. You have cheated on your love to God. You are cheating on God. It's a fearful statement. Fearful statement. The gospel says, no man can serve two masters. He will love the one and hate the other. That is a fact. There is, it is an either or situation. There is no together. It doesn't go together. It's either you love the Lord or you hate the world. It's, so that's why John gives a direct command. Do not love the world. And I'm telling you, as John did at that point, young people do not love the world. That is a command. What does it look like? I want to share this and I want to share some things to help people here as well. What does it look like to live as a Christian in a society that is increasingly becoming what Christians, you know, they don't believe what Christians believe. They don't say what the Christians say. This is the world we are living in, right? Yes or no? They don't, they don't like how you live as well. Or to put it in another way, what do you do when you realize that you are living in less and less like Jerusalem and more and more like Babylon? You understand? More and more your, this world is becoming like Babylon and less and less it is becoming like Jerusalem. Whether you like it or not, that is reality. And I am asking you, do you know how to live in a world you cannot control that. How do you live in that world? In how do you live in Babylon? In the Bible, Babylon was the center of iniquity, carnality, and worldliness. In this culture, this culture where we live in today, is just the same as the Babylonians. The world today offers the best of everything. If you look at it, pleasure, opportunity, riches, money, anything, anything materialistic, the world will offer to you. That was exactly how it was during the time of Babylon as well. And here it says, you know, the world will tell you, come to me for the best life now. That is the lie of Babylon. So Babylon, the modern culture, which the government also supports, by the way, government is also pouring in a lot of money to support this, is always trying to seduce us away from the love of Jesus Christ. They are trying to stop you from worshipping Jesus and start worshipping Babylon, the world. This has sadly crept into our church as well. I want you to pay attention to the description which John again gives in Revelation. 
Revelation 17, 3 to 6. I want you to pay attention to the same description about Babylon. How it is described over there. Revelation 17, 3 to 6. Can somebody read? I saw a woman sitting in a... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I want you to pay attention to this. You yeah, are filled with abominable things. I like another verse which actually translates to the filth of her adulteries. That is what is the word there. Continue. On the forehead. What is the name? Babylon the Great. The mother of prostitutes. And the abominations of the earth. That's fine. The, thank you. You see the title which is given right on the top. Babylon the mother of prostitutes. Just a, before if you connect it with James chapter 4. You can see that God James is calling you adulterous generation. Everybody who has taken the love away from Jesus and kept the love for themselves is who? Babylon, the world. I want to give you the assurance that God in the later times, this Babylon the Great is overthrown in chapter 18. If you go and read in Genesis, go to Revelation, go home and read. And there is rejoicing, rejoicing of the saints at her demise in chapter 19. I just wanted to show you that, you know, we are living in that world today. This is the modern Babylon. If we are living in the modern Babylon, how do we live as Christians in this place? That is my message to young people. How do we live as Christians in this modern Babylon? The good news is the Bible tells us how. Amen. The Bible tells us how we need to live. And the best example, there are many examples in the word of God, but the, one of the best examples I use is the life of Daniel. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. For us to live in this Babylon, to, for us to be as a Christian, true Christian in this world, in this modern Babylon, we need to, if you're taking down notes, take this. We need to know God and his word and know where to draw our lines and do not cross them. Let me repeat that again. You should, if you want to live in this modern life of Babylon, you should know God and you, you should know his word and ha know where to draw the line. And not to cross them. Amen. In other words, I will give you three. I know you will find it difficult to remember. I will give you three words to remember. The first one is resolve. Resolve. The second one is learn. And the third one is realize. Resolve, learn, realize. That is all you need to take away from today's message. Young people. Let's get into the first one. Can you read Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, T, A, 8, sorry, 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Amen. That is fine. Thank you. The, I want you to, if you have an underline that, resolve. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. He resolved. Try to draw this picture. I want you young people, you know, young people. I want you to imagine. I know how few guys cannot imagine, so I will paint that picture for you. I want you to imagine Daniel and his friends, okay? They are around 18 years of age. Any 18-year-olds? No 18-year-olds? Thankfully. Are you under 18? Anybody under 18? Oh, nobody's under 18. Raise your hands here. No, they're, they're ashamed now. I'm sorry. Okay, I won't. Uh, under 18. Above 18? Yeah, close to that, right? 
Daniel and his friends were around the age of 18. And they were taken captive to a different country. A na their nation was defeated. The temple was destroyed. And they are going into a glittering and powerful nation of Babylon. Babylon, which in today's context, we can call it as the first world nation. Something like the US and the Canada, if you were to compare it. They were in a privileged place. In a land of opportunities. And they got enlisted in the service of the king of Babylon. In other words, they got one of the best jobs in the market. The best jobs. They were in a fruitful country. They got the best jobs. They received education of the Babylonians. Which is like, you know, it's like saying you got admission in the best university in the whole world. These are the things which Daniel could not control. I want you to understand that. You cannot control the situations you are in. Daniel could not control where he was. His nation was destroyed. His temple was gone. He was held captive. He was given the best education. He was given the role. All that he could not control. But there is one thing he did. He resolved that he will not defile himself. That was in his control. He said that he would not defile himself. He said that he would, I cannot do anything about the circumstances. I am in. I am being captive. Or the Babylonian education I received. Or if I, the job which I am in right now. I, am, I cannot do anything about it. But I can draw the line and what will make me defiled. I can draw that line. I will not disobey the living God. He took that resolution. Many of us, we are approaching December 31st. Very nice day when everybody will think, oh, I need to make a resolution. Then one week later, what resolution? Which resolution? If there was a resolution, then they'll say, oh, I think that was the resolution. That was three years old resolution. That's not the resolution I'm asking you to do like Daniel did. Daniel took a decision not to defile his body in the name, for the name of the Lord Jesus. Not to give in, in, in other words, not to give in to the indulgences of the present world that would defile us. Now you may ask me, young people might ask me, what is this indulgences? What does it mean? It could be anything that in our lives that is causing us to defile or disobey God. Pay attention. It might be, make, it is anything which is making you go away from Him. It is anything which is actually taking you far away. It can be your time, it can be your friends, it can be the company you keep, it is the usage of gadgets, it is the usage of technology, it is what we watch, what we say, what we listen, what we follow, who we follow, who are our role models. Everything is an influence in your life. If anything takes you away from God, you are part of the world. Make a resolution. You will not defile yourself. The biggest fear young people have, and I'm speaking to parents here, the biggest fear they have is the fear of rejection. They don't like to be rejected by their friends. They don't like to be shunned away by their friends. I want to give you a word of encouragement. Can you read 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 2? 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 2. Yeah. 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 As a result, I like this translation better. As a result, they who, they 
meaning believers. Believers do not live the rest of your earthly lives for human, evil human desires, but rather do it for the will of God. Verse 4, verse 4. They, again they, who is there there? This is the, your friends who are unbelievers. Your friends, your society, your circles, your school, your university, your workplace, wherever you are, they are surprised. They should be surprised. Why? That you do not join them. Oh, amen. Oh, they will abuse you. you they, should, they should look at you and say that you do not join with us. I will ridicule you. It does not matter. You are called for a bigger calling. Know that first of all. I keep telling young Christians. I keep telling young people wherever I go. If following Christ hasn't cost you anything, has not cost you something, you need to stop and realize, are you really following God or not? If there is a slightest of chance that you realize that you are not following Christ, please say no, stop and turn, repent and go back to the Lord. Because it is more important that you obey God than you obey man, as it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Daniel and his friends resolved, took a decision, was confident, was take a mindset, was ready, that whatever the consequence, whatever happens, we will not defile ourselves in front of the Lord. Take a firm decision. That is the first thing. Resolve. The second thing. The second thing you need to, next thing you need to know after deciding is to, st after deciding to stand firm is learn what and where to draw the line. What and what. Learn what and where to draw the line. Where do you learn? Can you turn with me to Daniel, in that same book, sorry, Daniel chapter 1 verse 17. Can somebody read? Who gave? God gave them learning. Oh man, that's it, that's fine. Thanks, Sangeet. Who gave? God gave them learning and wisdom and understanding and everything. It goes on. If you read on there, it says that and what to find. Uh, can you complete that? Sorry, Sangeet. Complete it. Oh. All visions and dreams. Elevated gifts. God gave. Daniel learned. Where do we find it? In this. In this. You want to learn? Learn the word of God. Know the word of God. Daniel learned. God gave him knowledge, learning. He gave him nothing but the word of God. Daniel spent his time learning, learning, learning the word of God when he was in his young age. When he was in young age. Because that is when he knew, when the situation came in front of him, he knew this is the line I will not cross. How did he know this was the line? Because the word of God taught him. He learned him. God gave him through the word of God that he learned. Learn like Daniel did. We must draw the line. We must draw the line. Wherever your personal situation or if it demands or the demands of society would lead you to compromise this biblical standard. Anywhere, if the world is leading you to compromise this standard, you need to know 
I will draw the line. In order to know that, first you need to learn the word of God. You need to learn the word of God, my dear young people. Now you see how important, if you want to live in this world, you need to resolve, you need to learn the word of God. Know the word of God. Learn the scriptures. You will know where to draw the line. You will know it. The Holy Spirit in his conscience will bring the words back to you. If you learn the word, in the Holy Spirit will come back to you saying that, I'm using an example. Nobby, don't cross that line. The word of God says that is an adulterous person. That is going to the world. Don't cross the line. The word, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. How does the Holy Spirit reside in you? Through the word. Can you read Romans chapter 3 verse 20? Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Because by the work of the law, Romans 3.20, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, thank you. For the through the law, through the word of God, you become conscious of your sin. Why are you unconscious on the sin? It's because you do not know the word of God. The minute you understand the word of God, you will know where you stand in front of God. What is your path? Why is it wrong? Why is it right? You know it because the law reveals to you the sin you are in. Knowing the word of God and obedient to it shapes your identity as a Christian. If you have an identity, you know some of the problem with our generation today, some of the problem with you young guys, is you don't want to be identified with Christ. It's a shame. It is a ridicule. Yes or no? You might not get friends. You might not be involved in a lot of activities. Your identity, hence you decide to actually shape a double identity. When you come to Sunday, you are the best Christian available. Outside this, nobody knows you're a Christian. I want to ask you, we must learn to live out of the world, not in the world. You are living physically, but they should recognize you and say that this guy is different. This guy has got an identity which I cannot relate to. On the other, instead of you attracting yourself to their identity, you should have the identity of God which attracts them to you. Learn the word of God. That is how you become an identity based in Christ. Thirdly, I want to quickly conclude. Thirdly, based on what we discussed, if you resolve to stand firm on the word of God and the stance you take will have consequences in some way or the other, but realize, the third one, realize God is sovereign. Realize God is sovereign and he is always in control. Always in control. Always in control. Then it should be, when you realize that God is in control, if you live in like that, like how Daniel and his friends realized that God is still in control, then you will be confidently say, like how it says in Daniel 3.17, if I am thrown, if we are thrown into the fire, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, God we serve will deliver us from it. Amen. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand, from the king's hand. He will deliver it. You will be confident when you realize. But you will also say, verse 18, even if he doesn't deliver us, even if he does not, we want you to know that I will stand strong on my convictions. I will stand strong on the decisions I made. I will stand strong as a Christian. Even if he doesn't deliver me. 
that is the conviction because you need to realize god will take you sometimes in the fire he will be there sometimes he will take you through the fire that is okay that is according to god's divine plan thank you jesus we will not serve we will not serve another kingdom if we know god this way young people the way daniel and his friends drew the line you will know where to draw the line if you learn the word like daniel and his friends did you will be able to know when that when to draw the line and when you see that you're alone in that situation like daniel and his friends you will know that you are not alone god is in control that is how we live faithfully to go to the new jerusalem from this babylon over the past few weeks i want to share this with the church over the past few weeks especially to parents we as a part of the youth group bobin renoy jones with their families have been praying have been ministering to the youth and there have been lot of sessions which we have had and i want to tell you that it has been impactful yes but one thing while we have interacting with them some of them have been interacting for months some of them have been doing it i want to tell you the reality there are many of our children who are involved in the world they are living in a modern babylon it's not because they want to they struggle with it the struggle is real it's extremely hard for our young people to stand in this babylon the minute they walk out of this church the minute they walk out of your homes maybe the struggle becomes so intense that the devil in this world is continuously at them continuously so i'm asking you like all of us the four families who i mentioned we got together and united together in one thing i want to be like you know i want you to be i want to emphasize this not because it doesn't happen i want you to be i want you to understand parents have a major role major role in the lives of these people when they step out mothers and fathers out there mothers and fathers out there i want you to do like paul says i want you to wrestle in prayer wrestle in prayer because the forces which you are dealing with in this world is more stronger than you can imagine the only thing you can do is wrestle in prayer Colossians chapter 4 verse 12 says Ephaphras I'm replacing Ephaphras with the mothers and the fathers of this church I'm replacing it and it says mothers and fathers is always wrestling in prayer for you young people I want you to realize I hope you get parents who wrestle in prayer for you because then only you will stand firm in the will of God Amen. Amen.